Saudi Arabia sees the writing on the wall. I think what they're doing is they're realizing where the hockey puck is going to, and they don't want to be left behind. And what it really comes down to is them putting a lot of their funds into crypto and digital assets. There was a new report that came out uh, today from Blockworks. Saudi Arabia's $620 billion wealth fund has backed crypto-friendly VCs. And when I talk about them seeing the writing on the wall, they are one of the hugest producers of oil in the world. Well, I mean, not the only ones out there. They're actually 12% uh, for the global production of oil. Canada being 5.8, 5.3 in Iraq. And uh, coincidentally, uh, United States and Russia, 14 13.1% in the top two. Not uh, very well known, but that is the truth. But you can understand Saudi Arabia's OPEC, UAB, Iraq, and their condition that they have right now. The position that they're in is that there's not going to be oil produced forever for every single thing that we need as far as the combustible engines. There's a lot of things on the horizon. There's a lot of uh, electrical cars, electrical vehicles coming about. So they kind of see where, where things are going. And this makes a lot of sense to me. So here's what's going on. Saudi Arabia has disclosed investments in nearly 40 U.S. venture capital firms, including some in crypto, blockchain, and Web3 relative investments. Now, I want you to, to, to note that just because they have a $620 billion wealth fund, it didn't all go into crypto. They're smart enough to realize, uh, and this is the same that I do, is diversification, I think, is key. The fund now lists investments the likes of Andreessen Horowitz, Kutu Management, Peter Thiel backed Valor Ventures, and a host of other ones. Pay attention to ones that they're associated with. Web3 and blockchain, A16Z, Polychain, Polychain Capital, Griffin Gaming Partners, and a, and a host of other ones, B Capital, and so on and so forth. So again, they're not putting everything into it, but they're like, you know what? Oil's not gonna last forever. Let's spread around these, this massive amount of revenue that we've produced over the years in, in oil and bring in the new era. So the outlet know that VCs have been guarded about their links to Saudi Arabia after the 2018 killing of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And of course, this is something I wanna uh, bring up because you might not hear about this too much moving forward because no one wants to be associated with Saudi Arabia, especially with what happened there. Saudi Arabia has made moves to diversify its economy be beyond depending on revenue from oil exports since 2016. And that's why they're really getting into not just commerce, but uh, into tourism and, and, of course, investments that uh, are outside of oil, which makes a lot of sense to me. And when I took, take a look at this, I was like, well, that's interesting because on this channel, I've changed my, my, my views on, on what's going to be the next big thing. I personally think that gaming is going to be huge. And this is just interesting that Saudi Arabia talked about this. And then there was an email this morning from the Daily Upside. They say Saudi Arabia pumps $38 billion into video games. $38 billion. Saudi Arabia produces 11, 11 million barrels of oil a day. The country's public investment fund will funnel $38 billion into its esports subsidiary, Savvy Gaming Group, and turn the company into a studio that develops and publishes video games. How likely is it that they might? I don't know, take a look at not just the Web 2 games, but maybe the Web 3 games that are coming out and take over some of those developments, especially with uh, the different companies that develop those games. The gaming market for years now, I didn't know this, has been bigger than the movie and music industries combined. Wish I would have known that before. Interesting. Savvy CEO Brian Ward hinted that the company may adopt the strategy currently favored by Microsoft of hoovering up existing gaming studios. Wouldn't that be interesting if it takes a look at Polygon Labs or some other different Web3 developers and go, you know what, we really like this. We're gonna take this over. Where do you think the price would go from that? Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And again, uh, gaming I think will be big. Here's another piece, Cardano gets on-chain gaming boost as Pima Layer 2 goes live. I didn't know what this was, but there's a new cross-chain network integrates with Cardano, which allows users to play on-chain games using ADA tokens and users of other networks to play Cardano-based games. When I first read that sentence, I'm like, who cares? How many Cardano-based games are out there? Just wait. Pima Studios released this feature for the Cardano blockchain on Monday, Pima Layer 2. 
Cardano users can play any blockchain-based games without needing to bridge the tokens to the network. That's huge. Because if you know about bridge and bridges and, and how they operate, they're risky. And we've had a ton of hacks. So now it's saying you can play any blockchain-based game without needing to bridge the tokens. Fame also supports the migration of games built on other networks to Cardano, allowing users of those networks to play a game based on Cardano without having to move assets. Bridges carry major risks. As such, Pima said all games in the network are non-custodial, meaning funds remain in the user's wallets and don't have to be transferred to the game's wallets, mitigating security risks. This is awesome. The release is the latest in a series of network improvements and features for the Cardano blockchain, with, which may ultimately add value to ADA tokens. And blah, blah, blah. So what I want to show you is this, Pima Studios. If you go there right now, link in the description, you can play a host of different games. And this one is called, it's a goofy game, Jungle Wars, whatever. It's an NFT-based game. I don't think that games are going to really take off with just these types of, uh, of games and, and card-based and things like that. But what I found interesting was, first of all, I could play this in my browser. And the second thing is, you see this MetaMask? I'm not a fan of MetaMask. We'll get that in a second. But you can just click on here, and what do you see here? Asked our Flint. NAMI. NAMI is a Cardano-based wallet, meaning you don't need a bridge. You can play this game to your heart's desire. Really, it's a little bit of gambling, too. Uh, and you can play this from wherever. And this is actually available right now. Now, what happens as time goes on? Well, I think games only get better. I'm waiting for the AAA-ranked or rated game to actually come out because these are just a little goofy. I think it'll be big. I could be wrong. That's why I'm going to have Crypto Stash on the show tomorrow. And we're going to talk about all these things we just talked about and where things are going and maybe what to invest into. So again, let me just think about that in the comments section. And then also about this MetaMask. This is interesting. This is Chris Bleck. If you don't know Chris Bleck, you should follow him. He's an interesting character. He's a advocate for immutable, unstoppable, decentralized tech, vicious adversary of everything that pretends to be isn't. And that's the truth. And he just calls out MetaMask on this. And other people have talked about this. I just haven't talked about it as, as much as I should. And he says, why stop using MetaMask, swap, and paying their fees? Because MetaMask is owned by Consensus. And Consensus is developing CBDC tech. Now, on this channel, we've talked about this numerous times. I think that CBDCs are, CBDCs are inevitable. I'm not a big proponent. I don't really care because what's going to happen is I think people are going to get into it. It's going to lead us into a mass adoption of of people understanding like how to use this, these digital wallets in their phone, but they're gonna screw up. They're gonna screw up, they're gonna collapse. Not they're gonna collapse, but they're not going to allow people to use their funds all the time. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think China and Russia, as they get into it, will start to shut down people. Just like we saw with the runs in the banks, there's gonna be other problems. And that will just say, well, I know how to use digital wallet. Why don't I just use the other digital wallets? like a NAMI or whatever else, and maybe get into Bitcoin and, and use a, a, a Ledger Nano wallet. Maybe I can just do, do that and get out of the system. Again, I'm not a big proponent of CBDCs. I just see where things are going to take it. But back to this right here, Chris Black says, and it's, he actually has a nice little reference here. This is from Consensus, Enhanced Monetary Policy. CBDC gives central banks direct influence over the money supply, simplifying distribution of government benefits to individuals, and improving control over transactions for tax purposes. And again, this is also by consensus. Recently, well, about a year ago, excuse me, January 13th, envisioning a future of central bank digital currencies for everyone everywhere. That's scary, but that is what consensus and MetaMask wallet is. You're welcome to keep using it. I still have to use it, it's true, but I'll be looking for alternatives. If you got an alternative, let me know. Put that in the comments section. And then next to last, Sweatcoin. I know people hate when I talk about Sweatcoin. It's because I'm biased and I own a bunch of it. But just so you know, it's free to download, free to use, and you get sweat tokens. Oh, and guess what? In September of this year, they're coming to the US. So all those sweat coins that you actually accumulate just for having on your phone for free, they're going to give you an actual sweat token that you can redeem for other value. But this is interesting. They're going to give you $24,000 not just as like a prize, but one lucky person, $24,000 a year for simply walking each day. They're looking for a chief walking officer who will receive a monthly paycheck. Yeah, you read that right. Chief walking officer just for walking around and having on their phone. You can get paid by that. 
All this person, and it's only one, is required to do is walk an average of 5,000 steps a day, send a swell with a sweat coin foundation every month and attend media interviews, which I think would be pretty cool. Like just to be on like, I don't know, Fox News or CNN or something or whatever the kind of outlets there are, Twitter spaces, my show. Uh, unlike Solana, the move to earn app Steppen, users don't, aren't required to make initial payments or buy an NFT. It's 100% free to start up. People looking at the prize should, should have a valid Sweatcoin account. They also require to stake 25 sweat and pay an opt-in fee of one sweat. It's okay. For every 3,000 steps, you get that one sweat. People based in US, China, Russia, Pakistan, or any restricted location based on sweat terms and conditions are not allowed to participate. So sorry, America. Not until September. And you can thank your boy, Gary Gensler, for that one. And lastly, I can't give you all the good news and just leave it like that and go, everything's going to be great and fantastic. There's a little bit of balance. It's not too much hopium in here, but I do like to talk about the positivity. But there's an interesting article, and it talks about Bitcoin versus gold. And the largest hedge fund manager, which is Ray Dalio, says, and he is pretty much, I thought it was a big Bitcoin proponent, but he's like, look, he expressed that uh, he prefers gold much more over Bitcoin, even though he says he holds a small amount. And he states Bitcoin has no relation to anything. Bitcoin status as a form of digital gold is still unproven. It's too volatile to be money or a store of value. Gold is stable because it's been a reliable store of value and medium of exchange for thousands of years. That's true. He does own some, some Bitcoin, but uh, it's very limited as compared to gold. And this got me thinking. And also got me thinking about there was an interview between Chuck Todd and Senator Elizabeth Warren where Chuck Todd just says, why are you so against Bitcoin? And that wasn't the right, the right question. The right question was, what is money? That's what he should have started off with. And it's the same thing for, for Ray here. I mean, he believes in gold. And I got to tell you, I own gold and silver. Surprise. I don't see why you can't have all three, gold, silver, Bitcoin. I think that's the new savings account, but it could be. Nah, that's, that's a pretty good one. Not financial advice. But the question then is, what is money? And I'm just going to make this very simple, and then we'll get out of here, which is this. I sent this to Elizabeth Warren on Twitter, and I think it makes somewhat sense. Again, you have to ask yourself, when people are talking to you about what's Bitcoin and why do you need it, because it makes no sense, when we use a dollar, the first thing you should ask them is what's money? What's money to you? Well, if you think about what money is, the dollar, it's a store of value, right? You store your value in dollars, you sell things, you put it in dollars, buy things, use dollars. And of course, when you buy things, you're doing an exchange, a conduct exchange. There's just two values. It's a store of value, conduct exchange. Now with Bitcoin, it's a little bit different. And Ray is right, it is volatile. But over time, and over a vast amount of time, I would make the argument that it is much more of a store of value over time than the US dollar. Here's the example. 1980, uh, you had, you could buy a grocery full of, uh, of, of food. 2000, probably half. In 2022, 20 bucks gets you yogurt. I don't know, especially in Puerto Rico. Now in 2011, 20 bucks of Bitcoin buy you groceries, about a full case. 10 years later, it could buy you a nice car. 2030, I don't know what it's gonna be. It's probably gonna be more, who knows? So those are the two things that I would counter argument with, with Ray. And then two more things I would actually add on, and this would be to Elizabeth Warren too, is first of all, it's scarce, it's only 21 million, which is a good hedge against inflation as the government keeps printing, which means my purchasing power goes down as it just happened right here. And the last thing is, and Elizabeth Warren talks about this, about belief. Look, since 2009, the belief in Bitcoin has only grown. I mean, you just see the different metrics that are out there and the Fidelities and the Black Rocks and all the different uh, big companies. Well, Black Rocks are a stretch. They're, they're more for digital, digitalization of assets, tokenization of assets. But you can see that where things are going, I think it's a pretty bright case. But again, these are the things that we're gonna come up against, the Ray Dalios of the world who just like, I just don't really get it too much, but that's it. So look, that's it for today. If you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. But that's it for today. Thanks for stopping by, I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.